This is an evening talk at the Friends Meeting House, February 13th, 89. That's actually a, a lovely name for a place. to get together, a meeting house for friends. Friends here implying not coming together as inferior or superior. but as friends on the same level, who like to share a common concern. About how we as human beings live and relate to each other. There are a number of new people here again tonight who haven't been here before. At least I don't remember having seen them. Why does one come here? What do we want of one another? If we're indeed meeting as friends, and I don't mean by that any religious term denoting any religious affiliation, if we're meeting as friends, how are we listening to each other? Are we listening to each other? Are we capable of listening to each other? Yesterday, in a discussion period in Springwater, some of us were there. One person mentioned over the years in listening to you, listening to your talks or coming to some meetings or going to some retreats, I've always felt that you have the energy and the capability, so much energy, And I just seem to vicariously ride, go on, for, go along for the ride. I don't remember verbatim how he expressed it, although he said it several times. I find myself in a, on a track of passivity. Wanting to be not just in your ambience of power and energy, but in other people's. What I read, what I see movies about goes back to my parents, always being the ones who are powerful and myself inadequate, incapable of reaching this kind of capability. And with that, a continuous state of passivity. And we were t 
talking with each other, trying to communicate with each other. But once we have an idea about ourselves, what we are, what we have become, due to our earliest influences, childhood influences, later influences, we get stuck, we get attached to this idea of ourselves. And being stuck with it in, the, in this rigid structure of an idea about what one is in comparison with what someone else is. How can one listen to what another person is saying? As we were talking, as we're talking now, is there a freedom to listen? Or is there already the idea of what the person who's talking is and what oneself is in her presence or in her absence? What one can do or what one cannot do or what one should do but cannot do? And all of this rigid, idea structure with its physical orchestration preventing the openness and quietness of listening. Mm. All one hears is the reverberations of the structure that one has built up, the ideas about oneself, the image, the convictions, the judgments. So in getting together as friends, is it possible for this rigid noisy structure about what one is and what the other person is, for that to abate. So there comes a quietness of listening into being. A listening that is most tentative, it doesn't know what one is going to hear or find out. One may be here to find out certain things that one already knows or wants to know, wants to find out, which is the rigid structure. Do you see that? If you come someplace to find out something, that you already know or imagine, have heard about or read about, how can you listen openly, freely, and silently? If a comparison is going on during this listening, of how much energy this person has in comparison to myself. There's no listening, is there? There's only the continuation of thinking which reinforces the structures that are already there, built up in the brain and throughout the body for decades and centuries and eons. Is it possible to see 
and put aside ideas about oneself and the other as they pop up or are revealed in the mind throughout the body. What I am, what I have always been, what I should be, what I can't be. How I want to be seen, how I want to be treated, how I want to look to others. All of these ideas is what makes up for this me, makes up this me. which cannot listen. It can only filter out bits and pieces to constantly patch itself up, reinforce itself, aggrandize itself, or put itself down. And in that structure we live most of the time. pleasurably at times and mostly suffering from the pressure and, and the rigidity of it, the pain of it, the conflict of it. The separateness, the isolation of it. isolation from each other. Actually, human beings, I think, want to be close to each other innately. Little tiny children want to be close to, to, to the mother or a loving human body. Yet, the way we live, we live in, in rigid isolation from each other, fearful of what someone may think of one or that someone may not approve one, talk badly about one, remember what one did, hold a grudge toward one, and oneself doing the same with others. Why do we live that way? A friend told me once, after having taken some five or six weeks to travel, hike, climb, traverse mountains and glaciers in complete solitude. He had himself be dropped off by an airplane someplace in Alaska, I believe it was. And he had a date with a pilot of that plane five or six weeks later at a spot some 50 miles or so northwest, I don't know where. He said on the day that he was approaching the landing strip with a little house, he didn't see that yet, just quite tired and exhausted, walking toward that region. He saw uh, the tiniest little pinpoint on the horizon, and as he walked closer, it turned out to be a human being. He said he felt all of his energies coming up and he started running. Finally, close to this person, embracing him. Didn't know who he was. He'd never seen him before. 
but was another human being. I hadn't seen any for six weeks. Is it possible, we're asking, to drop images about oneself and others, which means to see them, how they're operating, how they give us comfort and an idea of what we are, which is not what we are. We don't know what we are, but we hold on to ideas of what we are. And we hold on to ideas of what other people are, based on what they have done yesterday or last week or a year ago, five or ten years ago, or what their clan or race or nationality or religious group has done yesterday, a week ago, or a hundred years ago, or a thousand years ago. And we don't drop those images. We keep because this is how we live with each other. As images, as ideas, as past experiences, which cannot be forgotten, we think, which need to be remembered, which affect our behavior toward each other. Grudging, resenting, or loving. Do we have to live as images related to images, remembrances, ideas, and the pain of it, the rigidity of it, the lovelessness of it? We've been brought up this way, I remember. My mother, when she would get very exasperated at us children when we were naughty, she would say, I will never forget what you did, which was just about the worst thing that she could say, the worst punishment. She'll never forget what I did. And I remember the first time I said that to my son. Almost incredulous as it came out that I would say a thing like that. And there it was, out of exasperation. Sort of with a vengeance. One way of keeping control over someone. I'll never forget that. Why do we live that way? And is there another way? First of all, this whole structure of self-image and remembrance and bringing up what one remembers about someone, the grudge, one has to see that, really see it, and not judge it as good or bad, right or wrong, justified or unjustified. To see it see it as it comes up, as it operates in its divisive and alienating ways, creating animosity and distance and separation 
just to, to observe the whole thing from beginning to end. Not saying it's right or, not, right or wrong, putting oneself down for it, or blaming it on, on, on others, or saying that's human nature. Seeing it and questioning it at the same time, wondering if there can be another way in which this human mind, which is so, so chock full of remembrances, can be free for one moment of all of that and meet each other without the past. The past as it comes up as a memory to be seen as memory, as an interference, as a distortion. a distorting influence on meeting each other now as two human beings who haven't seen each other in six weeks or six years or six thousand years. Someone says, yes, it is possible. <clears throat> and if the next question is, how is it possible? How can I do it? The answer is, I don't know. Awareness is not something to be learned or practiced or controlled because it is free of the self-structure. It has nothing to do with self-structure. It has nothing to do with image, self-image or other image. So it is not practicable by the self. It comes on its own. At an instant of resenting or angering or wanting and a moment of awareness. What's going on? An instant of stopping not because one wants to stop, but because there's a moment of awareness. And at that moment, can, can there be a seeing at a glance at what has been going on? At a glance. No need to endlessly think about it. What we were up to an instant ago can be seen at a glance, wanting something, hating someone, avenging something, greedy for something, hostile towards someone. It can be seen at a glance by all of us at any time. problem that arises is that the instant there is there's some clear awareness of what we're up to, what is going on, we don't want to see what we see. We don't want to be like that. And the image is there again of being the opposite of what one has just seen. trying to become the opposite of what one has just seen it is, is, the, is the fact.
which is the immediate putting into place of an image where there was an openness of seeing in the raw what was going on. So can there be a remaining with what is, what is going on without substituting the image of what one should be like? Can one see that this is actually going on? in another moment of awareness, and another moment of awareness. Also hear the siren at the same time in the ticking of the clock. The breathing, the heartbeat. Sensations throughout the body. And the sound of a car. <clears throat> all of it being there as it arises in all simplicity, without choice. as judgment comes up, to see that as one listens to the car going by. Can, can everyone in this room here, tick, 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 tick. Can that be there without anyone commenting on it, wanting it or not wanting it, knowing it or not knowing it? Just tick, tick, tick. Without an image. Or if the image comes up of a clock and me sitting here hearing that clock, that's just image. That's just idea, that's just memory. Tick, tick, tick. That's not memory. What is it? And does it interfere with all the other sounds or any of the other sounds? If there's no naming it, no wanting it, no repressing it, not knowing it. Very often,
Very often, people ask me this work that you talk about of being aware of oneself. in whatever one is doing, relationship at work and so forth. Doesn't this just lead to more and more selfishness? To more and more self-consciousness? I don't want any more of it, I've got enough of it. Does one mean by that that one is discovering self-consciousness and selfishness about oneself? That one is coming into direct touch with it? Maybe for the first time? Amazed how much of it is there? Almost all of the time? It's not that awareness creates that it just sheds light on it. What's wrong with finding out what is actually going on in ourselves, in our relationship with each other, and in one another? We are self-centered. We are self-conscious because we think about ourselves most of the time. That is what self-consciousness means. Conscious of oneself, thinking about oneself. And with each thought about oneself, all variety of emotions being triggered throughout the body, good feelings and bad feelings, anxious feelings, and feelings of longing and desire, feelings of fear or terror. As one thinks about oneself, all of these emotions being called into action throughout this physical organism. That's what is going on. Can one discern the difference between thinking about oneself with all the emotional involvement and seeing directly a moment of anger or fear or grudge, resentment, greed, seeing it? Not thinking about it, becoming aware of it, as it happens, this instant. And as we said before, at that instant, does thinking about oneself set in, set in again, which is the end of awareness. And the, the fresh coming into being of self-consciousness, self-enclosure. Awareness does not lead to more self-consciousness or self-centeredness. It reveals it. it. It throws light on it, on what we are, most of the time. Can one bear to see that? 
without immediately closing the shutters and starting a new train of thought. How one should become better or how the others are worse or how hopeless one is or that there may be some hope in the future. Which is all thought, self-conscious thought. But the end of awareness. Awareness shows that thought is going on about oneself. Do you see the difference? The tick, 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 that's no thought. Listen. It's just there. But it's a disturbance. I wish it wasn't ticking. Can't they turn that off? That's thought. And with that can go an immediate annoyance. Anger, one comes here to sit quietly and why this ticking. Or the mind can sort of tick along with it. Which is not awareness. It is, I don't know how to describe how to, to label that. It's not awareness, it's just incorporating that sort of in one's humming, in the humming of the brain. But just to listen, without knowing what it is, the word may come up, but the word is not what is going on. Likewise, an instant of awareness at a moment of anger or fear. What is it that's being revealed if thought doesn't immediately take over? Can one remain with the actual fact, the actual happening? Which is a different mode of being. It is being in touch with feeling, sensation whatever is going on, and all the sounds inside and out. Not knowing where it will lead or where it has come from. One has to do this for oneself, experiment with it, play with it. Last week we had a discussion period here. And someone kept mentioning that human beings are not really separate, that they are there is a hum there is a unitary movement of all humanity, I think is what this person said a unit, unitary movement of all humanity, of all the world. One unitary movement. And the question was asked, does one really see that or is that a concept? Is that an idea? That's a vast difference between the idea of all humankind being one, without separation, without division, and actually seeing that. Somebody asked, what's wrong with having a concept of the oneness of all humankind? What's wrong with it? Why not have that concept? It's a very inspiring one. That wasn't said, I'm just adding this. One can 
get a rush or fix out of thinking in those terms, and get attached to the feelings. That issue when one thinks of the oneness of all humankind. But thinking about it is not seeing it. There's a separate thinker who thinks about that in order to make himself or herself feel better. The, the danger of being attached to such concepts and using them freely is that they prevent seeing the separateness from which we all suffer. It is because we suffer from separation and isolation that we cling to concepts of unity. And these concepts of unity hide the pain of separation and the fact of separation and do not end it. just as a, a drink taken or a drug taken does not end the pain of feeling separate and isolated. It's just a momentary fix. Will one look directly as it comes up in the feeling of discontent or discomfort? Will one look at what makes for this feeling of isolation? Will one wonder about it? Whether one can be directly in touch with it? Putting aside all ideals of what should be, or what one should be like, or what the world should be like? And feel out what one actually is like from moment to moment without judgment. Taking the pain that comes with it without calling it pain. Because the moment we call it pain and think pain, we run away from it into some kind of an escape another concept, another memory, or another fantasy. Can one be with each moment of raw existence without wallowing in it, make, without making a thing out of it, conceptually, image-wise? Conclusion-wise, this will be like this forever, or it has been like this forever. Seeing these conclusions arise and dispelling them. Because they have nothing to do with the flow of this moment, which is unknown, until we make a concept out of it. Is this too hard to follow? If it is, can one let go of all one knows and start freshly listening out of silence, the silence of not knowing and not wanting to know, just listening? inwardly and outwardly, whereby listening and looking are not two separate things.
what is this instant before I know it, before thought comes up and takes over? We will end here for tonight. 